an original MCM production. Good morning, community brainstorming. Good morning. Thank you. That's the kind of energy our children need to hear when they're forced into modern day slavery, when our children are sold. What about that guy at Subway? What did he say on TV? The younger they are, the more money he will pay for a six year old for sex trafficking. I would like to take a uh, <clears throat> special point of privilege to talk about Universal Campus. We have one of the principals here that's doing an outstanding job at Universal Campus, which is affiliated with the Milwaukee Public School, their partner. Raheem, uh, Kenny Gamble, Tosha Davis, uh, Bria Grant and a number of other people are working extremely hard in our community, not only to educate our children, but to also be involved with civic engagement and the economic development of our various communities. So I want to thank uh, Universal and thank you for being here this morning. Okay. I would like to recognize the board members that I serve with on the community brainstorming, would you, all of the board members of community brainstorming please stand? All of the board members of community brainstorming, please stand. All of the members. These are the people that do a lot of the work to bring a program together every single month and I think it's just really important that we recognize them. Moreover, I want to recognize all of you. This journey of human trafficking, sex trafficking, we brought it here to community brainstorming for you to help us to deliver the message out in the community. And by all the people I see here, You've done a great job, and I most certainly appreciate that, as well as our chair, Dana World Patterson. Give yourselves a round of applause, please. <laughs> this T-shirt, this T-shirt, who was this T-shirt uh, donated by? The woman that's going out the door. Frida, Frida Webb. Frida Webb, I'm, I'm calling attention to this T-shirt that you gave us for this issue today. You want to just tell us why you put this on here? Uh, it was an effort on behalf of a number of people in our community to do goodwill as activists at Juneteenth Day. So we adopted, adopted the logo. It takes a village to raise a child and heal a community. So we wanted to share that with you and a number of people helped out at Juneteenth Day. We just been mingling and talking to some young people about just words of encouragement. Thank you. Thank you. As uh, Pam said, my name is Martha Love, and I'm one of the board members of Community um, Brainstorming and have been for a number of years and most certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here and bring to you very important issues that impact our community. We have an awesome uh, community panel here, Judge Donald, Dana World Patterson, Bevan Baker, our health commissioner, Faith Colas from the Salvation Army, Jermaine Reed from Fresh Start, is that right? Fresh start, Brenda from uh, NAMI dealing with mental health. So our objective here today is to show you the impact of human trafficking on children in our community. And I have one of my mentees here. You want to stand up, Jada Vukovic? This is for her. This is for her. This is for my other sweetheart over here, Miss Bria. You want to? You want, to, you want to stand up and her girlfriend? This is for them to understand how they can be confident women. And we have some men here. We also 
advocate very strongly. Young boys are brought into commercial sex as early as four, five, six, seven years old. I know it doesn't sound real, sounds like a lie, but would I stand here publicly and tell a lie like that? No, I would not. But you have to understand that it is real. It is real. It is organized crime. It is a billion, several billion dollar business. And we have to certainly be aware of it. We have missing and exploited children. And we have to be aware of how we can protect our children. We got to go back to the old fashioned way of knowing who's your mama and your daddy and your grandmama. We got to know all of these things and we got to know that they are not pedophiles and they're not trying to get our children into modern day slavery. I do understand we have survivors of human trafficking here in this room today. This subject could trigger some of the misery that they experienced on their journeys of 10, 15 years. We have Dana World Patterson here, who is also assistant pastor, that can help counsel with you if you feel some of those triggers. And believe me, what I'm saying is true. There are a lot of people here that I know personally that was involved, that was taken, that was coerced due to fraud. And I love you. I love you. That's the magic word. I love you. But. I need you to earn two or three thousand dollars a day. And if you don't, you will get your teeth pulled, or you will beat with a chain, or you won't get no food, or you won't get your heroin. So I know I may sound dramatic, but I, as you all know, I'm just real, um, real uh, serious about this. And the one thing that um, I most certainly appreciate is when we started on this journey, um, Judge Rebecca Dallet, where is she? Stand up, please. Judge Rebecca Dallet is the first judge that we went to to ask to be a panelist. We appreciate everything that you do. She's given some hard, a lot of years to sex traffickers, and we appreciate everything you do and all of the other judges in this room that's giving steep uh, giving a lot of time to people that rape our children. Thank you. We appreciate everything that you do. I would like to introduce to you Dana World Patterson, one of the founders, along with myself, and chair of the Human Trafficking Task Force. Dana. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Martha. I stand before you this morning because some things shouldn't be. Trafficking women and girls for sexual exploitation is the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world. They say that it garners $150 billion a year. It's running as a top three to drugs and guns. And this is despite the fact that international law and the laws of 134 countries criminalize sex trafficking. Some things shouldn't be. Yes, human trafficking is happening in faraway countries and to those women and girls, them over there. And that shouldn't be. But it's also in our backyard. Former. General Attorney J.B. Van Hollen said human trafficking has occurred in all 72 counties. Sex trafficking is a human rights violation. Some things shouldn't be. Colab, a sex trafficking survivor said, they forced me to sleep with as many as 50 customers a day. I had to give the pimp all my money. And if I had not earned a set amount, they punished me by removing my clothes and beating, with me, beating me with a stick until I fainted. 
electro electrocuting me and cutting me. Survivors of sex trafficking tell stories of daily degradation of mind and body. They are often isolated, intimidated, sold into debt bondage, and subject to physical and sexual assault by their traffickers. Most live under constant mental and physical threat. Many suffer emotional trauma, including symptoms of post-traumatic stress syndrome, PTSD, and disassociation. They are at a greater risk of contracting sexually transmitted infections, including HIV, AIDS. Many become pregnant because Johns prefer no condom and are willing to pay extra. Hence, they have to forego often unsafe abortions. Many, and we say some things, shouldn't be. An estimated 30,000 victims of sex trafficking die each year from abuse, disease, torture, and neglect. And I don't know about you, when we heard a few days ago that the woman was found burned to death, the thought came to mind. 80% of those sold into sexual slavery are under 24, and some as young as six years old. Martha Love and I met a woman that was sold at four by her father. 13 is the average age a girl domestically is trafficked, and that number is becoming closer to 11. Seven years ago, my world made a detour when I recognized that anger from the girls in the schools was a cry for help. And the light bulb turned on when I asked a group I was working with how many of them had been touched inappropriately. To my dismay, 14 of the 15 girls had been touched by their grandfather, their mother's boyfriend, their brother's friend, as they went around the circle. And unfortunately, with that light bulb, there was a huge awakening because vulnerability is one of the main things that a trafficker, a pimp, looks for. Children should be playing, learning, and growing to be positive contributors, not victims of forced fraud or coercion to perform sex acts. Do you remember being 13? One pimp gives an account, five points he says he looks for. Someone with low self-esteem will be my first choice. Molested already by a boyfriend, uncle, father, their mother's boyfriend. Three, can't deal with pain and pressure at home. Four, they buy the dream, and the pimp is willing to do whatever it takes. Painfully true, he said, if I F the head, the body will follow. The truth is, when he's not threatening her, he's acting as if he loves her. Truth is, they trade women and girls like they trade baseball cards. Truth is, heartbreak at home can be a leading factor. Truth is, 80 to 85% of our girls feel invisible at home. Another convicted, felon, another convicted trafficker said, you can buy a woman for $10,000 and make your money back in a week if she is pretty and young. Everything else is profit. Some things shouldn't be. Human trafficking is often a hidden crime. It lurks beneath the surface. And accurate statistics are difficult. Say difficult. difficult. They're difficult to obtain. We'll share these statistics, but we know that these numbers are low. Researchers estimate that more than 80% of trafficking victims are women. And if 80% are, are women, 50% are children. Milwaukee is known as the Harvard of pimp school and the hub of human trafficking. 
And although I've looked, we can't find where that's documented. But the fact that it remains true in someone's mind is reason for us to pause and pay attention. We're dealing with the unthinkable. So in closing, every day we are faced with a harsh reality for millions of people world over and right in our communities who find themselves trapped in an exploit in exploitative and abusive systems, bought and sold like objects, and treated with no dignity or human decency. All forms of modern day slavery share some common characteristics. They're forced, victims are forced to work, are owned or controlled by another person, are dehumanized and treated as commodities, and are physically or psychologically constrained or coerced to think they are unable to escape. Yes, there is an invisible fence. We know of accounts of women rescued from cages in Milwaukee. Women who were chained in closets. We know of women who every day have triggers from sounds and smells. Women with screws and bolts and brandings in and on their bodies. Women that must face the door with an exit plan. And those who didn't begin to feel until many years after the life. I stand to represent a community of people that say some things shouldn't be. And that help is here for your hidden wounds. Now I'm asking you, will you stand with me and those others in the community when you hear of a strip club who sued the city of Milwaukee and they will try again September 17th to receive their license? Will you stand with me and others and be a nosy neighbor? Will you tell the truth to your women, to the women, to the girls, to the boys, to the men in your family when they say they want to have a, a, a bachelorette party? Will you speak to your boys when they're asking their friends at school, their girlfriends at school to call them daddy, that that's inappropriate? Will you talk and will you stand with me and just beat the drum and tell the truth that this is happening in our community. And as shameful as it is, it's us, the community, that's going to make a difference. Will you stand with me when you see something? Will you say something? Will you do something? Because some things shouldn't be. Wow, that's our chair. <laughs> you gotta have that fire to advocate for children. We say children because there are so many people that we just can't save because they're so into what has happened to them and they just don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. But it's for you here today to take back some of these messages and try to help us save these people. So how many here today work in social service and work with domestic violence, work with human trafficking? How many people are here today? Would you please stand so we can know who you are? Great. We appreciate you. We appreciate everything that you do. It is extremely important that we know in our community, besides the Human Trafficking Task Force, we have other advocates out there. So at this time, if our uh, health commissioner is available, I would like to introduce one of the biggest advocates in our city around health department concerns, human trafficking, domestic violence, Bevan Baker.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Martha. And thank you all for being here uh, this, this morning for what is uh, truly a, a community issue, a public health issue, and a global issue. Um, glad to be here, as always, on behalf of our mayor and all the men and women in the health department that allow me to do the work that I do. Um, there are so many statistics, so many things I could talk about. This is largely framed as a legal issue, sometimes a geo geopolitical issue, but most of all, it's a public health issue. And it's a Milwaukee issue, it's a Wisconsin issue. Um, so I'm gonna kind of follow up on some of the things that, that Dana said, but I, I did want to give this some context. Um, and for moviegoers in the room, how many people have seen Straight Outta Compton? If you haven't seen it, okay, a few hands there. So. $56.1 million, so it's a big movie. It's going to uh, probably make $100, $200 million in the next month or so. Um, about 20 hours ago, uh, Dr. Dre actually did a press conference in New York, and he apologized. Why do you apologize if you made $56.1 million on a movie in its first weekend? Uh, Dr. J apologized because of what he had done in his 20s to women. He, he lamented about what he had said about women in his 20s. He talked, he talked about the culture that he created about what he said about women. He's 50 years old. He's half past autumn and he's coming home. So as we begin to dissect why we have this issue of human trafficking, see, nothing can survive. No organism can survive unless it's being fed. It has to be fed by something. It has to be created by something. And, and maybe Dr. Dre is coming home and saying, I have created the spear in which young boys and some young girls can believe that it's OK to begin to degrade women, to begin to look at the bodies as not a temple, but as a prophet. And he came home. NWA was provocative. Their lyrics were the first to have parental advisory printed on the CD case. But yet, 56.1 million to capture the, the luster of that story, to capture the moment, why they transform medicine, how they transform geopolitical, how they transform music, all with their music. They were reaching out about what was coming out of that neighborhood. So I went back and looked at some of the trafficking statistics in Compton in 1991 when they hit the scene. Sexual assaults in Compton in 1991, rapes in Compton in 1991, violent crime in Compton in 1991. And it mirrors what's happening here in Milwaukee. The same types of statistics, the same types of things that are happening. So this is a public health issue. But public health issues just don't happen. Yes, we have emerging disease, things that comes, some virus that comes out of nowhere that we have to curl back that virus. But most public health concerns happen longitudinally over years and years of neglect and denial and not giving it attention or funding or coming together as a community to solve the issue. That's when it becomes a public health issue. So on with what I was brought here to talk about. Um, Dana sent out a message that it takes a village to sort of raise our children, to get them through as we deal with this issue. So I went back as a historian and looked at, as far back as I could go, the history of the word village. And what did it mean? And how, how do people come about this whole notion of a village? And there, and, and, and there are different meanings for it in different parts of the world. But the one that resonated with me most was, was the, the, the fact that there were hamlets, there were small communities that maybe had five to 30 families in it. And they couldn't graduate to be called a village until they did one thing. Could anyone 
have an idea of what that one thing they, that you have to do when you're a hamlet to graduate to a village? What's the one thing you think you have to do? It's not about population, so that's not an answer. What do you think it is? Let me give you the answer. A hamlet could not become a village until it built a church. So once it built a church, it was called a village. And I think when you look at the, the metaphorically, it was saying that this community couldn't come together until it began to understand that with faith and with people and with surroundings, you could build up a defense, a perimeter. So village was, was brought together for sociability, defense, and then thriving. But without faith, without a church, it wouldn't be called that. So I looked at that. I looked at it again and I said, well, why is that? Well, if you have one thing that you can agree on in a village, it should be protecting children. But if you have no faith in a village, then you cannot protect children. And because of that, we have to begin to look at what is wrong with Milwaukee when we have 356 churches within 26 square miles and we cannot protect children. So it, it, it must be the, the issues that are too tough for us. It must be that when there's forced to co curse sexual activity is too much for this village. It must be the sexually transmitted infection, which we're number two in the nation in chlamydia, top 40 largest city, and number four in gonorrhea in the top 40 largest cities. Maybe that's too much. Maybe it's the permanent damage that happens to these young girls' organs. Maybe it's the incidence of HIV. We are an epicenter for men who have sex with men here in Milwaukee. Maybe it's the fact that in Milwaukee County, we are trending nationally in terms of opioid dependency and heroin deaths. So if you sprinkle one part HIV, one part heroin, and one part human trafficking, you have the perfect cocktail to make Milwaukee not even recognizable to the people who live in it. So there's a, maybe it's the psychological trauma that exists. Maybe it's the fact that we talk about the mental health issues, we talk about the genesis of rebuilding the mental health complex, but we are not willing to build a village to fix it. So this whole notion of the things that we can do, and I thought about this on the drive over. Yes, there's some things that we can do. There's some things that are being done. And I look in my world and in the health field, there was a journal article published in April of 2015 in Pediatrics Magazine. Local people here did that, Children's Hospital Medical College of Wisconsin. They'd done a study. It was a retroactive look back. The new study said that when they looked at the majority of healthcare providers and the whole geographical area here in Wisconsin and other regions, only 28% believe that they have the ability to identify victims of sex trafficking. Although we're expanding healthcare access, it is not what you get, it's what you do with what you get. So we have more people going to the doctor, more people getting access, but with less people understanding what to do when they get there. So 28% can't recognize sex trafficking victims. But the good news is there's help on the way. We gotta train people. We gotta train them to, to look for what they don't want to see and see for what they're, what they're not looking for. And we've got to make certain that we do all those things so we can push prevention. And then lastly, we've got to get over this issue of no data, no problem. Because we say, well, where's the human trafficking data? I mean, we know that there's some in the justice system, the legal system, but that is an outcome downstream. We need to know upstream. You cannot prosecute everyone because you don't know everyone who's committing the crime. So if we look at how many sexual predators, how many, you know, human trafficking people we take down in Milwaukee County that go through the court system, that's laudable data, but it's not enough to get people to invest into the problem. Because those who are taking care of the problem know that we have a problem, but no data, no problem is usually what happens. We need to identify the root causes, because it's the root causes, AKA NWA, and what Dr. Dre was talking about, 
is part of this data. That's the macro data. If we wait until the bodies are floating in the, in the, in the lake, it's too late to give mouth to mouth resuscitation. We've got to go upstream and figure out why people are being thrown in the lake in the first place. And then as I close, you know, I wore a t-shirt the other day, and Dana knows about this, and it had 13 on it. So someone, I was in a checkout line, and the person asked me, was that my shoe size? <laughs> and, and really, and that's why you wear the t-shirt, so you get asked. And I explained to them very loudly that this was the average age of, of trafficked victims in Milwaukee, 13 years old. And I was in a checkout line, and everyone's face dropped. And, and if you've had breakfast, you can throw up now. But it was an ugly conversation. And I said, this is an ugly problem. And we've got to stop putting lipstick on the pig. And we've got to understand that we're dealing with the pig. And we've got to go ahead and fix this problem. And we need to come home, as Dr. Dre did, and we need to apologize. And then we need to get to work. Because this is our problem, because of what we have not done, what we are doing, and what we fail to do in the future. And Dre got that. And I couldn't listen to his lyrics in 1991. And I can't listen to him in 2015. But I did hear his apology. I did hear his cry. He's thinking about it as a father, as someone who has children now, grandchildren. He's thinking about what he needs to do to change this sphere and this problem that we have. And that's my call to you. No more statistics. No more lying. 356 churches, we are bigger than a village. But until we acknowledge this problem, it will still take a village. Thank you very much. Can we get another round of applause for our health commissioner? I like the way he um, clearly identifies what he's talking about so we all can understand. He's talking about sex trafficking and what is your responsibility now. I want to tell you a story about a woman named Con Constance Stark. You can look her up on the website. Constance Stark, her father realized that the way for he and his wife to maintain themselves was to start selling her at four and a half years old. They sold her, and like she said to Dana and I, she never had a childhood, she never had an adolescence. So, Constance also said she has something called disassociation. That is when you're being raped repeatedly you're being punished, as she was told us, as later in life, she discovered that she was a lesbian. So the men that purchased her thought, wow, she's a lesbian, so we can buy her and just do you know what until she's no longer a lesbian. That's how stupid people were. But Dana and I were at the University of Madison, and she was one of the panelists. Her name is Constance Stark. Please look her up on the internet. She's an artist now, and she does a lot of things from a disassociation point of view. And that's a word that we need to start learning. It's disassociation, because as these young women and boys are being raped, that's where they go. They, kinda, they, they go away. They, they just go away. And uh, survivors, as I've indicated, if this is triggering anything, please, Dana is available. That's why I had her go on first. So at this time, I would like to hear from Jermaine Reed. Jermaine Reed is an on-air personality now, even though he's with Fresh Start today. And he comes on every Wednesday on WNOV at 3 p.m. So. Jermaine is going to start talking about the vulnerabilities. Then we'll go to Judge Donald that will talk about things as it relates to the courts. Jermaine. Uh, can I go to the bathroom right now? That's all I want to know.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're here talking about a very important topic um, that is relative to our community and one that we can't afford to ignore any longer. And I do appreciate those individuals who have presented before me. Um, there's taking, I was taking some notes and I learned some things. Um, the overwhelming or large majority of children and youth who are in foster care placements and group homes, I would say, are in healthy and in safe environments. But the reality as being a child welfare worker is that there are a number of our children who are in these environments and they're not conducive for their emotional, mental development. And how it is undeniable that most children and youth who are victims of commercial sexual exploitation have been involved with the foster care system at one point in their lives. And according to one research that was done, the OLP Foundation and Human Trafficking Search Network, they indicated that not only that a large percentage of these young ladies who come into care or who are rescued from um, raids on trafficking, that they come from foster care community, but the traffickers themselves, 25%, come from the foster care community. Um, there was a number of individuals who were interviewed down in Chicago. They were traffickers. And out of this small group of pimps or traffickers, they indicated that 100% of these traffickers came from a childhood, a family environment where there was physical violence and abuse. Eighty percent of them indicated that they were victims of sexual abuse. So when we think about this, that um, minimally half of all the commercially sexually exploited children come from care. Whether it's in Connecticut, 98 percent, California, 50 percent, and the raid that was done right here in Wisconsin a couple years back, a two-year period, indicated that there were 77 young ladies who were recovered from trafficking. And those are just the recorded, documented numbers. But of course, the undocumented numbers will eclipse that by far. My purpose for being here today is to help our community understand two things. One is how family environments can be the first place that grooms children for sex trafficking. My second purpose for being here is to help us understand how that foster care can be a breeding ground for child sex trafficking via many of our policies, practices. And I don't see human trafficking being separate from foster care because the culture of foster care can suggest that we exploit children. If you look, I pass you out a, this, I want you to look at this. How many of you have these at your table? You see this right here? Pretty beautiful young black girl. Beautiful, in fact, I've had the pleasure of working with young little beautiful black girls like this in my agency since 2005. Do you see this beautiful teenage? Y'all hear? Do you see it? So my question is, this comes from the adoptuskids.org, which is a photo listing site to market young children, vulnerable children who are in need of adoption. So my question is, what is the difference between these two young girls and this one? Because oftentimes, these young girls become this young girl. And so we have to ask ourselves, when we administrate child welfare and when we select homes to take in these vulnerable children, we have to ask ourselves, what are our standards for providing care to vulnerable children? Because the truth of the matter, and we know this, see, I like to talk about what we know. I can't talk about what I don't know. 
But what we do know is that there's a lot of people who are motivated by the subsidies that are attached to foster care, to foster children. And we know that foster children are more profitable when they are removed from their birth families. Are y'all with me today? Yes, and placed in a foster care setting. We understand that there are some incentives around um, fast-tracking, terminating of parental rights based on the 1997 federal law Adoption Safe Family Act that came under Bill Clinton's administration, which was intended to prevent children from careening in the foster care system. So we have to terminate their biological connections and place them in a system to rescue them. But I don't want to beat up on foster care community because, again, remember my first point was this, is that in many of our homes we create a climate and a culture that grooms our young children, prepares them to be trafficked. So when we talk about prevention, well, first, first let me back up because I'm getting a little excited. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm owning something this morning. <laughs> what I would like to do before I take my seat is just show you some similar, I love the statement, the theme that children are not for sale. How many of you believe that this morning? Children are not for sale. Some things you just don't sell. You sell cookies and milk, but you don't sell children. Right. You're right. But right. well, we have to look at how we administrate child welfare, and we, we know that some folk are just in it for the money. We know that some agencies get adoption incentives. We, we know that some states get adoption incentives for the more children that you adopt out. We know that a lot of these folk who are caring for these children don't have the skill set. And so my question is, how do we remove a child from one crack house and place them in another crack house? How do you place them, take them from one un environment with a single parent mother who's living beneath the poverty line with multiple children no man around only to place them in a home with a single parent mother living underneath the poverty line with multiple children because we found out that children are profitable so I'm challenging you this morning not to sell children so let's look at some similarities. With human trafficking, we've established that it is a $150 billion industry where children are exploited. Foster care is a multi-billion dollar industry where children, can I get a witness, are exploited. Large numbers of victims and human trafficking, you know what color they are? Black. An overwhelming number of black girls make up the foster care. Can you make the connection? There's this thing called placement instability and human trafficking. We move these children, these young ladies around from hotel to hotel, from city to city, county to county. Guess what we do in child welfare? We move them around. They're always in transit. We move them from home to home, from agency to agency, from county to county, from city to city, until that child learns. You know what she learns? She, she learns, one, that there's no thing called stability and I'm transit, but she also learns that the value that I bring to a relationship, whether it's my pimp or my foster parent, is based on the money that I bring to this relationship. They're commodified. And we understand something, let me say, that there is, uh, that, that a lot of these children are viewed and treated as collateral. We understand that they have value. We also understand that it's a competitive market out there for a pimp. It's hard out there for a pimp. He got to make sure he's on his grind. Well, you know what? When we get those referrals on a weekly basis from the state, got one yesterday for some infants. And we know that infants are most desirable. And so everybody vie for trying to get those infants into their agency because with those infants come dollars. So how do we, what do we do? What do we do, Jermaine? What do we have to do? 
Um, first is awareness, and I agree with um, Commissioner Baker. I agree with Dana World Patterson, is that we have to create awareness on a family level and community level. Awareness meaning, first you gotta know that it's happening. The second thing is you have to know how to identify, like Commissioner Baker said. Then we have to do the prevention thing, and prevention thing, if we know that 93% of all sexual abuse victims know their assailants, 93%. It was either a family member or it was someone closely associated to the family. So, so we can cure this, we, we can address this, simply by doing this. Grandfathers, fathers, uncles, brothers, male cousins, stepdaddy, and mama boyfriend. Keep your privates out of children. Oh, we can cure this. This is what, mother, this is what we can do. Since 93% of all the sexually abused children or victims know and have a relationship with their perpetrator, their uh, perpetrator, what they need to do is fathers, grandfathers, uncles, brothers, male cousins, mama, boyfriend, and stepdaddy, keep your private out of children. That's what we do. It's real simple. So that, that's, that's prevention. That's, somebody said that's prevention. <laughs> the next thing that we can do um, is intervention, which is cooperate among stakeholders. Everybody coming to the table, pooling our resources and getting on the same page and sharing the same message and having the same mission. So that's basically what I have. I could talk all day, but you know what? I want to give space for these other beautiful people. If a number of you attend poetry, there's a saying that they have, they call it O. Oh. So can we give an O? Oh. <laughs> wow. He is serious, right? I want all of you, and I know you're very uncomfortable, and that's good. I am happy. If you scream and you say, how dare she have this subject, I am elated. If you're mad, if you figure, why would she bring this subject up? I'm happy. I'm, I've been miserable for six years trying to work with folk to get this message out. So talking about selling children, if you've seen the ad that Dana World Patterson put together with Serve Media, Serve Marketing, if you've seen this on the bus shelters, or if you have seen this on the billboards, instead of having exotic, call this number 101010, it's two girls in a vending machine. And some people said, how stupid, why would you put kids in a vending machine? But if you read the bottom caption, it says, there are some things that are not for sale. So I'm gonna pass this around so you can see it. I'm not sure how many Dana has. You, you think you got enough to share one with everybody? Okay. So at this time, I would like to introduce to you a friend. He's a judge in our community, been a judge for a long time. He's running for a higher office and we need him in place. You'll agree with me when he's finished. We talk about vulnerabilities and we talk about victims and we talk about getting justice for victims. Judges, thank you. Gramlin, thank you. Rebecca, uh, Bradley, Br Judge Bradley, Laura Gramlin, thank you all. And of course, Myers, you will be another one that's a freedom fighter for children and making absolutely sure that children get justice. When these pimps, these traffickers, these monsters go to court, you do the right thing. Judge Donald. Tell your friends. Good morning, brainstorming. Good morning. Um, I, I am delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to be part of this panel. I have to say, this is a really a dynamic panel and uh, I, I'm getting an education this morning. And so 
when I was asked to be part of the panel, I thought about exactly what I was going to say. And I didn't want to, you know, I, I did some research. It's easy to get, to get the statistics online. We all know the numbers. We all know the problems. And I wasn't quite sure if me getting up and talking about the statistics again was going to kind of help bring this issue home. So uh, I'm going to change my approach a little bit because you've, you've heard from some very dynamic speakers about what the problem is and how big the problem is. So I'm going to kind of focus into um, how the problem ended up on my bench and my docket. So yesterday, um, a case came in, and I thought, oh, this is very appropriate because uh, Saturday I will be speaking on human trafficking. And, it's, and the, the charge, the complaint is uh, trafficking of a child. It's 948.051, uh, Perrin 1, which is a Class C felony. It has a maximum fine of $100,000 and a maximum period of imprisonment of 40 years. Now, the sentence is bifurcated, so the maximum term of confinement is 25 years, and it can be followed by 15 years of extended supervision. So that's a long time. That's a, a long-ass time. So, so uh, I, I'm just going to kind of read to you the complaint and then kind of talk about sort of how difficult this problem is. Uh, but before I get to that, I, I will say this that in listening to our speakers this morning, the one thing that I'm beginning to understand and realize, we're not gonna solve this problem until we recognize that these are our children. They're, they're, they're not a them, they're not somebody else's child, they are our child, my child. So when I start thinking about this as my child, then yes, I'm motivated. I'm going to do something about it. So the complaint reads as follows. Detective Thomas Deneen reports that he spoke with A.H., who was born on May 13th of 2002, who stated that she ran away from home on May 6th of 2015. So A.H. is 13, the average age. A.H. stated that she walked around the neighborhood all night, sometime around 3 a.m. on May 7th. She was walking near Mount Sinai Hospital when a car stopped near her. The male driver asked A.H. if she needed a ride. This is a 13-year-old child out at 3 a.m. being approached by a male asking if she needs a ride. A.H. told the driver that she had nowhere to go. The female passenger later identified, and I'll just say J.M., the defendant, offered to let A.H. stay at her house, and A.H. got into the car. The male driver drove A.H. and the defendant somewhere near 29th and Center. When A.H. got out of the car, the male driver tried to keep A.H. from leaving the defendant. Then the defendant and A.H. walked away. The defendant told A.H. that they were going to go and be outside until late Friday night. The defendant told A.H. to walk down the street and to act normal. The defendant told A.H. that she was going to make some money. The defendant started flagging down cars. When one pulled over, the defendant got in the car, which then drove away. A short time later, the defendant walked back to A.H. before flagging down another car and getting in and driving away. A short time later, the defendant walked back to where A.H. was and asked if she had made any money. When A.H. told the defendant that she had not made any money, the defendant became upset. The defendant told A.H. if she makes any money, she should put it in her sock. 
A.H. then, A.H. and the defendant then went to the defendant's home located on North 29th Street. The defendant went to the basement where she smoked a white chalky substance, which A.H. believed to be crack cocaine. The defendant had purchased on the street for $10. They woke up in the morning on May 7th, around 10 a.m. The defendant told A.H. that they were going to make some money. The defendant gave A.H. a pair of short shorts and also told A.H. to put on a brown wig. A.H. said they looked like prostitutes' clothes. Once outside, the defendant saw a black male driving a car and flagged it down. The male drove them to the area of North 29th Street and Lisbon. When A.H. got out of the car, another female walked over to her and asked her how old she was. When A.H. told the woman that she was 12 years old, the woman took A.H. away from the defendant. The woman took A.H. to a nearby house where police were called. The woman took A.H. to the nearby house, later identified, and I'll just say T.N. She stated she saw a female she knows uh, to walk the streets as a prostitute named Juicy, getting out of a truck with a younger looking female. Both were dressed as if they were working as prostitutes. When T.N. saw the young female, she immediately asked A.H. how old she was, and when the young girl said she was 12 years old, T.N. told Juicy, and this is what I really love, oh, hell no, and told the younger female to come with her. In the Miranda statement of the defendant, she tried to help A.H. with her prostituting. The defendant stated that she took the girl home, gave her a sandwich in a shower. The next morning, she gave A.H. some condoms and told her, always get the money up front. She told A.H. to put the money, and I excuse, excuse me, but I'm just going to read it because we're being real. She told A.H. to put the money in her pussy, and then when the guy wasn't looking, to put the money in her sack. The defendant also showed A.H. Uh, three spots to run if a guy was on some bullshit. So, this case is in front of me. And there's a couple of things that you don't know. Because the defendant, who essentially was trafficking the young girl, was a person that I had as a judge at Children's Court. She had been in the system. So this, this is a cycle that has just sort of been progressing. And uh, I'm of the opinion that until we start creating resources where we can put these young children, because when we essentially take the runaways and lock them up in juvenile detention, because they won't stay put, is adding more trauma to their lives. So that is not the solution. We need places, and I can tell you, my colleagues are here, if there are safe places to put these young girls and boys, we will put them there. I'm amazed that as a society, that we have more places for lost and abused animals than we have for our children. So I'm not gonna try and blame any one part of the system because I'm in the system and I see it on a daily basis. So I'm going to accept my role and my responsibility. But I think it is incumbent upon all of us to realize that these are our children and we all have to accept our responsibility. So I, I, at this point, I'm gonna sit down because I know there are some other speakers and I know this is a great panel and I'm glad that we're talking about this topic. 
I can tell you that I've been provided with some amazing handouts that give us a definition, that gives us a language and a basis in which to have this conversation. Because the only way, the only way we're going to solve this is by talking about it and doing something about it. And I, and I can tell you that the judges that are here, including myself, care deeply about this. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. I will tell my friends. All right, thank you. Let's give Judge Joseph O'Donnell an O. O. <laughs> I would like to recognize my alderman and the author of the same nosy neighbor, Russell Stamper, Jr. You see he has a lot of aunties, right? <laughs> I want to get something for you. The four and a half year old woman that I talked about, her name is Const Christina, Christina Stark. Please look her up on the internet. This is a young woman that later in life decided that um, her, her uh, life would be uh, as a lesbian, and her father said, well, we're going to sell this lesbian and see if men can, you know, do the uh, out of her. So it's Christina Stark. A number of people ask me to repeat the name. It's Christina Stark. So we have Exploit No More here. You want to stand? Exploit No More is a organization that is raising funds right now to open up a facility, I understand, to house young women that's been sexually exploited. Is that correct, Katie Lynn? So without any further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Brenda. Brenda from, from NAMI. I had the opportunity to hear her do a presentation um, over at the Coalition for Justice yesterday. And she's been out here herself fighting the fight as relates to mental health. Brenda. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to come to you at the perspective again of mental health and mental health issues. But also, too, is that I'm the Director of Education and Outreach for NAMI Greater Milwaukee. That's the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I remember 10 years ago, I presented in front of the community and brainstorming in regards to my journey with mental health issues in our community. So when we talk about a village and what it takes in order to protect our children, it's a village. I have a son that lives with a chronic mental health disorder, uh, schizoaffective. He is not doing well at all. Um, Martha talked about disassociative personality disorder. That's what he has. Because of the trauma in his life and the multiple incarcerations, the multiple stays at the mental health complex, the multiple rejections in our community, because and I'll be real today is that a lot of us are self-serving. A lot of us don't want to get involved. It's your problem. It's not my problem. I'm doing fine. So you deal with it. You deal with those bad kids. You deal with that because I'm doing just well. And so we have to come to the perspective of the village. But a, a disassociative personality disorder, because of the trauma, a person develops another personality to protect the personality that they were born with because the trauma is so intense that I have to protect myself and whether or not I protect myself that if I am violated on a regular basis, I will go someplace in my mind so I can deal with it because my brain cannot deal with all of this. I also have a sister that was raped when she was 13, post-traumatic stress disorder she lives with, bipolar disorder she lives with, got into prostitution, not feeling well because the village was not there for her. 
the village was not there for my son is that my sister now, and I don't know where she's at because she is heroin addicted. So when we talk about the village, so I'm gonna talk about the perspective of mental health. We have in this umbrella of mental illness, we address bipolar disorder, we address schizophrenia, we address anxiety disorders, we address OCD. But one thing as I dug myself into learning about mental health is that trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder in our community, we are so unhealthy that we have normalized behavior. We have normalized that. And when we talk about the monsters and the pimps, who made those monsters? These young men and women are raped in their homes on a regular basis. But do we talk about it? We say, no, don't you go to school and talk about that. We live in poverty. We live in despair. We live in violence. And as a child, when they're growing, this brain of ours is so complex that the brain becomes to be rewired the wrong way. So we develop such unhealthy coping strategies. And our kids, we don't want to listen to them. Our children can come to us and talk about depression. They can talk about anxiety. They talk about their fears. They may want to talk about sexual assault, but what do we say to them? Get over it. It ain't that bad. I ain't got time to deal with this. Go to school. Get good grades. But until we deal with the underlying issues in our and we got to be real in our unhealthy community because of all of the despair, because of all of the trauma. So we don't create the pimps. Why, why do you think that young men and men think it's okay to do that to a female? Was he raped? Are we looking at the backstory? Was he raped as a child? Was he violated when he went into prison and then when he comes back out, we say to him, well, you're free now, so you go get a job and you're okay. But does anybody want to talk about how I'm dehumanized when I'm in jail and when there's a cavity search, I got to drop my pants and have people go up my butt constantly, excuse me. But we don't want to talk about that. We just say, you're out of jail, just like the young ladies and men when we take them out of the sex trafficking field. What are we doing to help them with their mental health? Because what they have become is that have, they've become sexual creatures. They don't know any other way to survive because their brain has, is rewired in a very unhealthy way. So what are we going to do for these young people when we do get them home? And then when they start acting up or when they aren't unable to get their lives together, are we going to say to them, well, what's wrong with you? We got you out of this. We tried to get you a job. You're not acting right. What do you want me to do? But have you really addressed those underlying issues of that trauma that that child or that adult has to deal with? If we're talking about young ladies and men at the age of seven and eight, when we do get to them, what do you think they're like? I mean, some, you know, like I said, we, we, per, we tell them that we got you out and now you're out here and you're free and, and life is great, but no, I have to deal with that trauma all the time. My son had, he said something to me before he got really sick. He said, do you know what it feels like to wake up every day and not know where you fit in this world? And this is what we're doing to our children too. Where do they fit in this world? How do we make a difference? Touch one, reach one. If somebody wants to talk to you, if a kid wants to talk to you, will you talk to them? Or is it that way, if I talk to them and they tell me that they got a problem, then that means I'm gonna have to do something about it. But you know, I'm supposed to go to the movies. So I can't deal with that. If a kid is in school and they need to talk to a teacher, well, I can't deal with that because I have to make sure that I get these scores up. So we really need to start that discussion about the secrets that we have in our families, the secrets that we hold, because we pass this on. This is generational. 
These secrets are generational. This just didn't happen yesterday. The violence just didn't happen yesterday because we became self-serving about what we wanted. That village went away. And when, we, when you look at foster care, there was a time that kids didn't go to foster care in our community. Mama took the kid, aunt took the kid, but then now what we do is that in our community, we say, well, that kid is bad. Well, I don't want him in my house because, you know, I've got to do this and I don't want him to taint my kid and I don't want her to do this and I don't want that. So put him into foster care. But there was a time that we didn't let our kids go into foster care. There was a time that we didn't let our elderly go into nursing homes. We took them in. But now we're sending them to nursing homes because I don't have time. Because we assimilated that we need to just get rid of stuff that we don't like because we've got to take care of us. So what I've done, and my journey has been long because I knocked on a lot of doors. So when I say touch one, reach one, there's a lot of people didn't want to hear what I had to say when I talked about trauma. The piece that you just saw from the young man, I wrote that piece because I wrote a production called Pieces in My Own Voice where I actually talk about sexual abuse, trauma, mental health issues, where we go out in the community with a theatrical production to address these issues. But one key component is that we go into the schools, but I'm not even getting the schools to come on board to say, we developed a curriculum where we actually go in with this production to get these kids to talk. And what really gets me is that we went to Hamilton High School and we had this production and people said, these kids are not going to talk about their journey. They're not going to talk in front of a whole crowd. We had like 300 kids and we usually have a Q&A after. And these kids talked about suicide, violence, sexual incest, all of the issues in our community because we gave them a safe place to talk about what was happening to them. And we also give them resources. How come we can't develop an app for our kids that if I need to talk, here's an app, here's a 1-800 or a number that I can call to talk through something. Why is a kid so vulnerable that they're walking the streets at 3, 3 a.m. in the morning? Probably because mama and daddy put them out. Probably because they couldn't deal with maybe some situations at school. Why we set our kids up and we as adults, we have to look at what we did. We created all of this. And if we fail to say that we're responsible, then we have, that we're not responsible, then we have our head in the sand. But what do we do at this point? So what we do when we go into the schools and we're trying to get in more schools, we're trying to get out in the community. And I hate this word evidence-based. I hate that word because I think there's a lot of good organizations out there doing good stuff, but I have to say it that the production, we had a research company come in and they have found that we have been evidence-based, that we're getting, we're decreasing the stigma of mental health, we're getting kids and adults to talk about it, we're moving people into services, but it takes one person. And I just want to say is that when I started this 10 years ago, I came from corporate America, I took a vow of poverty, because my son is my son, that's who I birthed. That is my baby, and I don't care what anybody says. People say, give up on him. I will not. I will never give up on my son. That is my child. That's absolutely my child. And that's what we have to do, but again, we, but also too, I realize that a mother's love is not enough. We need you. And I needed you. We needed the community. We have to give people self-worth and we have to look at the trauma that these kids are dealing with so they are not vulnerable to become a pimp or not vulnerable to want to be pimped out because you don't feel good about yourself. And if you see a little girl twerking, you need to just snatch her up and say, no, this is not what you do. We're not teaching our kids to be kings and queens. You have to value yourself. But we need to do that as adults in order to nurture our children. So what we do when we go out, green is the color of mental health awareness. We give these 
bandanas to the kids. We also give them these bracelets. There's a number on the inside of the bracelet where if the child feels like that they need to talk. But we need something for our community, though. We need something, an app, a number, or something for these kids to reach out before they're pimped out, before they're walking at 3 o'clock because mom and daddy or somebody put them out. Women, drugs, incarceration. Again, all of this just didn't start yesterday. This has been ongoing for a long time, but it takes one to reach one. So each one of you, when you leave out here today, if you see somebody and they look like they're in stress, or if you just see somebody, just say hello. Just that's all you got to do. And with a smile on your face. That's, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can we do another skip? This is one of our mental health professionals. Can we give her another round of applause, please? I would like to recognize our city treasurer, Spencer Coggs. We all know Spencer Coggs. He's been around for an awful long time. He was a state rep, senator, and now he is our city treasurer, and we are so proud of him. Thank you so much for all that you, you've done and what you're currently doing. Keep them taxes down. <laughs> we also have Alderman Joe Davis, who's here. Alderman Joe Davis, when we had our first reception uh, explaining to the community about human trafficking, Alderman Joe Davis and his aide, uh, I call him DJ Sherman, he's a great DJ, everybody knows Sherman, uh, they were the first to really help sponsor uh, some of the activities of the human trafficking, um, human trafficking of Greater Milwaukee to help sponsor our reception and we really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Joe. We have uh, Alderman Ashanti Hamilton, who is not here. Of course, Russell Stamper is here, and Malele Coggs. And all of the aldermen have, have made absolutely sure that there is a lot of information and protection in our aldermanic districts around human trafficking. I know for a fact that Alderman um, Russell Stamper meets privately with neighbors so that they won't have to give their name or their address when they're reporting trap houses and drug houses and reporting parents that are being abusive to their kids. Our alderman provides a safe place for those people to come and talk without giving their names, and we really appreciate that. Okay, now we're at the scene, and the scene is there's several bodies laying around, been shot up. Everybody's still fighting in the area. And so who comes to comfort the community? Who comes to comfort the community? That is Faith Colas and her program from the Salvation Army. Not only has the Salvation Army stepped up at this time, but they have also been working on human trafficking since the late 1800s. Privately helping people to back to good health. You've heard about the trauma that's caused for a six-year-old that's, that's forced into human trafficking. This person is 17, where do they go to get the deprogramming? Salvation Army. They are a champion in our community. Faith Colas is a champion in this community working with the Salvation Army. We had no idea what the Salvation Army did until Faith Colas really came on the scene. So Faith Colas, please come up and tell us about your latest program. Faith Colas. Good morning. Thank you, Martha. That was a great setup because this is a format for awareness. Awareness about human trafficking, awareness about each of the work 
that everyone on this panel does, how our lanes cross, how the lanes of what everyone in this room does cross, and it all comes under the village. Our role in the village with the Salvation Army Chaplaincy Program is one of a ministry of presence. That ministry of presence and the chaplaincy program came about as a result of one of the lanes that I manage in my role as community relations director for the Salvation Army. I got a call from Stephanie Finley several years ago about a meeting that was taking place with faith leaders at um, Progressive Baptist Church. And this group of leaders, about 10, was invited to be part of this group as a result of the work that's done out of the 7th District Police Station under the leadership of Captain Jutiki Jackson. I had, was unaware of this group, and one of my hats is to help the community understand that the Salvation Army is the largest social service agency in the world, but we're also a church. We have worship and community centers for in Milwaukee County. As a result of going to that first meeting, I continued to go to those meetings because these faith leaders were doing really good work in their community. Adopt the block programs, resource fairs, health fairs, back to school fairs, working with the aldermen and the county supervisors in their district, and again, working with the 7th District Police Station. With all of the violence that had begun to take place, um, Captain Jackson asked me, Faith, I think the Salvation Army could play a larger role with the City of Milwaukee Police Department in helping our communities with violence. We go into these situations and when we leave them, we leave families that we know are hurting. We know they're broken. We know they need help. There's mental health issues. There are issues of continued violence. And it's not just with the family that has experienced that violence, it's the entire block. Everyone is upset, everyone is feeling trauma. And so we think that the Salvation Army can help with all of your resources that you have. You're a large organization, and so what do you think about this? It was, it was perfect for a organization that is committed to serving others. And so we set about with leadership, um, pulling them all together, having conversations about how to execute this program, um, taking into account that there are many uh, chaplains and many clergy and many politicians and many other organizations that are all doing something in the neighborhood about violence, about mental health, about helping families find resources. We're just one of them. But everybody has an expertise. And our expertise is organization when it comes to disasters. And we find that violence is a disaster. We're living in a state of emergency in our neighborhoods. Salvation Army has been called out to the Sikh shooting. I was there for that, working with those families. We were called out to the Salon shooting. My husband and I were there working with those families. I've been to Joplin. I know what it's like to experience trauma. Trauma whether it's from Mother Nature or trauma because someone in your family has been gunned down by another member of your family. It is trauma. And nobody cares what color you are when they need help, when they need someone to lean on, when they need a question answered. That's what they're looking for. And that's what we provide. We, together with the City of Milwaukee Police Department, uh, sat down and worked out this program, did all the crossing of the T's and dotting of the I's as best we could to address this. This is a reactionary program. Let me be very clear on that. 
Components of this program are proactive pieces. That's our adopt a block programs. That's all of the work that each of these chaplains do in this community. I have some of the chaplains have joined us today, and I just want them to stand because these are just some of the 53 men and women that went through the training um, that are doing the work every day. Can you all stand? Thank you. These men and women went through a four-day training, uh, courtesy of the Salvation Army, courtesy of the Milwaukee Police Department and, and other community stakeholders to make it possible for them to know what it is they're going to see when they go on a scene. We are called out by the Milwaukee Police Department to be present when there is a violent act that's taking place. Sometimes we're called out for a vigil. Our purpose there is a ministry of presence, just to be there and let the family, the block, the people that are affected by the trauma tell us what they feel that their need is. And then from there, we can identify them with other agencies, many of the folks sitting here, many of you in this room. That is simply our role. One of the experiences that I've had recently was with a media representative. And I managed the media relations for the Salvation Army. And um, this was, unfortunately, the shooting and death of the young child in North Lawn. Our chaplains were there. And this media representative was there, was there with all of the others. And she said to me, there was such a calming effect when the chaplains arrived on the scene. And that's all we want to do is to take it from here and to bring it here so we can begin to have conversations. So we can begin to find out with their minister, their family, what took place and how can we prevent this from happening again in that family and for the rest of the block. Our chaplains will find victims of sex trafficking in some of these situations. Who knows why a violent act really takes place? I've received a call in the last year from Martha helping a family who was being trafficked and our role was simply to get them from Milwaukee to Michigan, back home. And we worked and we worked to make that possible, but we weren't the only ones. This is the beauty of this community. With all of our challenges, there are also lots of people that care and lots of resources available, but we weren't the only ones that answered the call for help. And I'm saying that to say that it's going to take a village. Our role in the village is the Salvation Army's chaplaincy program. It's also our other community resources. It's also when you visit Salvation Army at samilwaukee.org, you'll begin to find a link to other organizations. So if you have an organization and you want us to be a resource for you, so when we encounter families and individuals and boys and girls in need, we can send people to that website. People and their family can go to that website. Their home church can begin to work with the Salvation Army and some of these other organizations. It's going to take all of us. There's not one person in this room who doesn't have a family member who's addicted to drugs, who's dropped out of school, who's been molested, who's unemployed, who has a mental health issue. That's just five items. And like Brenda said, we don't want to talk about it, but that's okay. Get on the phone and call one of us and ask us for help. Look for the Salvation Army in your community. If you get a knock on the door from a police officer along with a member of the adopt a block 
Join that adopter block. Be that nosy neighbor. Really be that nosy neighbor. Thank you. Okay, we're at the end of our program, but there's just a few more things, and I, I guess from our organization, I don't follow the protocol, but I'm really sorry. This program has gone on longer than it should, but there's been a lot to talk about and tell you. So if my colleagues try to beat up on me, will y'all help save me? Yeah. Okay, say yeah so they can hear it. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I would like to um, ask one other person to come up, and that's our state representative, Latanya Johnson. Latanya Johnson. Latanya Johnson has been one of our voices up in the state legislature to prevent it being legal for three years olds to be able to give consent to have sex. State Representative Latanya Johnson. Hello, it's so wonderful to see such a vibrant, large crowd, especially surrounding this topic because Human trafficking is serious in the state of Wisconsin. Wisconsin is a feeder state. And last session, when we had testimony at the Capitol surrounding human trafficking, and I was able to take victims to the Capitol to tell their stories, it made a significant impact. Because we know these children that are being affected by human trafficking, they're not Republicans, they're not Democrats, they're children. But the one thing we have to do as a community is to make the Department of Children and Families do their job. When we introduce legislation to try and impact this issue, to make things better for children, because there's a small window that we have to get these children help. And that's between the ages of 13 and 16, because once they hit 17, they're charged as an adult. And those charges as an adult, even if those charges are later expunged, the Wisconsin law around exp expungement means you still have to check that box. And sometimes that prevents those individuals from getting that interview. If you have prostitution cases, you can't work with the elderly or children, so that eliminates CNAs in most cases, child care providers. And these are all skilled levels that these individuals can do, and in most cases, they're really good at. So it's been an honor to learn about this topic, but it's also been an honor and a challenge to try and get help from these victims. So for you as a community, the one thing that you can do to have the most impact is make us do our job. Make the elected officials, especially on the state level, because we can do something about this situation. We can pass a safe harbor law. But we have to know that these children are important to you. I was told by the secretary, um, of, the, the secretary of the Department of Children and Families that these children were not a priority. That I can call them children as much as I want to, but the truth is these children have been sexualized. And they have a hard enough time trying to find good foster homes, so they're not going to mix this population with their foster care parents. And if our department is unwilling to do anything to help these children, they're lost. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your interest. And please, please, please hold us accountable and make us do our job. Um, did anyone by any chance see Senator Lena Taylor? Where is she? I don't see her. Hi, Martha. Good morning. Senator Lena Taylor. Okay, we're going to conclude. Um, I just got a email, I'm sorry, a text from Keith Bailey, who's in North Dakota. They're out there to pick up some girls from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who are being prostituted 
and are involved in sex trafficking. He apologizes to Dana and I that he's not able to be here today. But he's going to, um, it's, it's a 12 to 15 hour drive, and he's going to be talking to the local authorities to make absolutely sure that they know who to contact our police department here in the uh, city of Milwaukee. This is the kind of thing that we're talking about. Being in North Dakota in the oil fields, taking our 10, 11, 12, and 13 year olds out there for the purpose of commercial sex. This is what we're talking about, where we need your help. If you see something, do something. One more person I would like to introduce, and that's Minister Hunt. Elder, Elder Hunt. Elder Hunt is from Pastors United, and they have a program where they go out on the streets as well with the police department to help try to resolve what's going on at the scene. So thank you. I want to recognize you from Pastors United and let everyone know that Pastors United is doing an outstanding job. So okay. at this point, I would like to thank each and every one of you for coming. I hope you learned something. Uh, one other thing, and I mean one other thing, two other things. <laughs> I have um, some uh, guides here. It's called The Prostitution of Children in America, a guide for parents and guardians. This is an excellent guide that gives you lots of information and the Human Trafficking Task Force number nationally appears on this particular guide. The other thing is you all are aware of Craigslist, right? You all purchase furniture and you do all kinds of things on Craigslist. Well, I want you to know that on Craigslist, there's a program called Backpage. Backpage is where you can tune in by state and buy as many boys and girls and babies as you would like. What the credit card companies did, Visa, Master Charge, American Express crippled Backpage. They will not allow any, any withdrawals from Backpage. We in the human trafficking community see this as an absolute victory. So you see where human trafficking is and where the profit is. I would like to thank our panel, Judge Donald, Dana World Patterson, our chair, our great health commissioner, Faith Colas, most certainly from the uh, Salvation Army and the community, one of the daughters of the community, Jermaine Reed and Brenda Wesley. Please give them a round of applause. production.